to serve as a replacement of the Pentagon's large inventory of fourth-generation fighters so production was cut to just 180 aircraft, 120 of which serve in operational units. The Navy and Marines also needed a new fighter, so the Pentagon committed to building a more multi-role joint stealth fighter that would eventually replace the F-15, F-16, F-A-18 and A-V-8 Harriers serving in all four branches. The last time an inter-service fighter bomber was pursued, it didn't work out. But Lockheed and Boeing both gave their best shot anyway, and the former won the competition. The JSF was supposed to a more affordable stealth fighter that could also be marketed to friendly nations, unlike the Raptor. The trickiest requirement for the JSF was the Marine Corps' insistence on making its version of the F-35 a jump jet. For historical reasons, the Leathernecks want jets like the Harrier that can fly off smaller Marine-operated amphibious carriers or remote forward bases. However, the compromises needed to make them work leave them significantly inferior to conventional fighters. Lockheed actually acquired schematics for a prototype Russian jump jet called the Yak-41, and tried to make the most aerodynamic airframe possible. To cut a long story short, the additional weight and bulkier fuselage necessary to make the F-35B jump jet version left all variants of the F-35 saddled with performance thresholds that are objectively inferior to the fourth generation fighters it is intended to replace. The F-35 has a maximum speed of Mach 1.6, compared to Mach 2 to 2.5 for the F-16 and F-15, respectively. Its service ceiling is 50,000 feet, compared to 60,000 for the other models. In 2015, the Air Force tested the F-35 in a short-range dogfight with an F-16D mounting external fuel tanks, and the test pilot complained that it was simply outturned and less energy efficient than its more agile opponent. This critique doesn't mean that the F-35 is a terrible plane. In one post, scroll down for English, a Norwegian F-35 pilot praises its ability to maintain high angles of attack. Nonetheless, the Lightning remains less kinematically optimized for air-to-air -air combat than most fourth-generation fighters. The Air Force and Lockheed, however, insist that the F-35 isn't meant to engage in a within-visual-range dogfight in the first place. After all, low-observable aircraft are stealthier when they are more distant from adversaries, and new beyond-visual-range missiles like the AIM-120D or British Meteor that can strike enemies up to 100 miles away potentially allow an F-35 to sneak up on enemy aircraft and engage them with missiles without having to get close. Such a strategy is aided by the superior characteristics of U.S. active electronically scanned array radars. In this view of things, the F-35 would act as a sort of sniper in air-to-air -air engagements, stalking its prey from a distance until it has a good angle for a shot, releasing its weapons and then hightailing it for home before the, possibly faster, more maneuverable, enemy has a chance to come close enough to detect it and retaliate. And if more intense air battles are anticipated, then the more specialized F-22 could take some of the heat. No stealth fighter has ever shot down another jet in actual combat, and long-range air-to-air missiles have only been used a few times in action, so how the F-35 performs versus fourth-generation fighters depends a great deal on theory rather than operational experience. The Air Force feels this strategy has been validated by the results of repeated air combat exercises in which stealth fighters have racked up kill ratios as lopsided as 15 to 1 against faster, more maneuverable fourth-generation jets. And because of its low observable characteristics, the F-35 can pick and choose when to engage and when to withdraw from a dangerous opponent's in a good position. Of course, those exercises are only good predictors of performance if they are built around correct assumptions about air warfare will work out. A big question remains, concerning how high the hit rate will be for long-range air-to-air missiles, which have seen limited use in actual combat. An estimated hit rate of 50% may prove optimistic. Here, F-35 doubters may point out that the Air Force overestimated the hit rate of its air-to-air -air missiles during the Vietnam War, resulting in disappointing kill ratios when pitted against North Vietnamese fighters in that conflict. Critics also point out that stealth would not prevent an F-35 from being detected if an enemy got close, as stealth fighters begin to appear on X-band targeting radars once the distance is short enough. Furthermore, Though optimized for minimal infrared signature, stealth fighters remain susceptible to detection by infrared search and track IRST, systems. Finally, the stealth fighters can be tracked using low bandwidth radars, which are typically found on ground-based installations. 
Such radars lack the resolution to engage a stealth fighter with missiles from distance, but they could be used to direct intercepts by fighters, or to stage short-range ambushes with the targeting radars of surface-to-air missile systems, the latter a technique used to down an F-117 stealth fighter over Yugoslavia in 1999. Another tactic could be to overwhelm stealth fighters with a swarm of lower-cost jets, accepting some losses while charging into the short-range envelope the F-35 is vulnerable in, a tactic that caused the defeat of F-35s by inferior Chinese jets in a RAND Corporation simulation. F-35 proponents, in turn, are skeptical that the ability to pull off tight maneuvers is as useful as it once was, a view in sharp contrast to that of Russian aircraft manufacturers, which continue to produce super-maneuverable jets with vector thrust engines. American air combat doctrine emphasizes maintaining a high energy state through speed, an altitude that can be traded for speed. Pulling off extremely tight turns may help dodge a missile but usually at the cost of so much energy that the aircraft will have little speed and altitude left to evade a follow-up attack. Furthermore, modern short-range heat-seeking missiles like the American AIM-9X and Russian R-73 can target hostile aircraft through a helmet-mounted sight without needing to point the aircraft's nose at a target, though doing so still confers additional momentum, of course. Such missiles are believed to have hit probabilities as high as 80%, quite possibly making short-range dogfighting agility a mood issue, though an F-35 configured for stealth can't carry any AIM-9s. There's another issue in play, can the F-35 carry a worthwhile payload? If the Lightning is to remain stealthy, it cannot carry external weapons, limiting it to just four, or, eventually, six, missiles carried in a stealthy internal weapons bay, plus a 25mm cannon. This does not compare favorably to the 8 to 10 hard points on most fourth generation fighters. This issue is even more salient when considering the F-35's ground attack capabilities in stealth mode, amounting to 5,700 pounds of internal stores, leaving them at a deficit compared to the roughly 15,000 pounds or more of external stores that can be carried on US fourth generation aircraft. To be fair, Lockheed has advertised a non-stealthy beast mode configuration of the F-35 with 16 wing-mounted bombs and missiles, allowing a full 22,000 pounds payload. However, this configuration remains only hypothetical. Payload brings us to the matter of range. Once again, the F-35 cannot rely upon externally mounted fuel tanks if it wishes to retain its stealthy radar cross-section. In compensation, the Lightning has longer range on purely internal fuel than most fourth-generation fighters. Unfortunately, this still means that both land and carrier-based F-35s will need to be based within range of intermediate-range ballistic missiles IRBMs, that are quite capable of devastating air bases or sinking carriers. Mid-air refueling could help with this problem, but tanker aircraft too may be vulnerable to attack, unless the Navy chooses to acquire a stealthy tanker drone. The Pentagon remains optimistic about the F-35's ground attack capabilities for a simple reason, they believe the F-35 will give it a convenient tool for penetrating increasingly deadly integrated air defense systems without having to put together a huge strike package, including jamming planes, wild weasel anti-SAM aircraft, escort fighters and so forth. As discussed above, F-35s wouldn't be invulnerable to ground-based air defenses, but they would have an easier time slipping past and dismantling ground-based missile batteries with fewer support planes put at risk. F-35 proponents also emphasize that the F-35 is designed around new digital technology to an unprecedented level. It has sophisticated sensors that not only soak up copious data from the surrounding environment, but then funnel it back for use by friendly forces via high-capacity data links. F-35 pilots use state-of-the-art helmets that allow them to see through their own aircraft, which is good, as the canopy on the F-35 has poor visibility to the rear. The F-35's mission systems computer is designed to automatically download mission parameters, while its logistics computer can offload status reports for technicians through a proprietary encrypted system. Thus, in the F-35, the futurists of the Pentagon envision a new networked way of war, wherein each fighter will serve as much as a sensor node for a larger war machine as it does as a distinct weapons platform. Of the course, the flip side of seeing the F-35 as the apotheosis of a networked paradigm is that it may be more vulnerable to hacking attacks and other electronic warfare systems than any warplane before, potentially allowing for a Battlestar Galactica scenario in which a digital surprise attack leaves many